Well, Dr. Drianska, you are a psychologist by trade, and yet your focus is, on, is in human trafficking. How did that work, and where did you get started in that? Yes, actually, I moved here all the way from Rome, Italy, where I was working on my PhD, then did a postdoc. And towards the end of my PhD, I started getting involved with a ministry, a missionary who was my mentor there. Yeah. She has been involved with street outreach to women, and as turned out later, some men in prostitution on the streets of Rome. And that's just brought the human trafficking to my attention. Of course, the heart of the researcher was like, well, what can we do? I could see there are so many psychological problems mm. that they are facing. There are so many problems with our society as well. It's not only the victims and the survivors that desperately need help in terms of psychological assistance, but also traffickers, uh, people who are clients, so Johns. It's a whole very complex world. And I started to research it. It was uh, great that uh, I found many resources. Actually, the American Psychological Association, which is our main authority in psychology, during that time was just finishing uh, to edit the results of the task force report on yeah. trafficking of women and girls. Mm -hmm. So I started doing research, started looking at what is general public thinking about trafficking? What do people know? What are some myths around trafficking? Mm -hmm. So God has just brought it all together. And when uh, I started working here at Biola, it's been a great privilege to be able to teach courses on it and really dive deep into to the topic and I'm also very thankful for some graduate students as this is the topic after their own hearts and this is what they are researching this is where they're working uh, right now with me so Great. that's a short story yeah I mean you talked about sex and prostitution right what other arenas of human trafficking are there yes uh, one of the facts that often gets overlooked we wonder where do we get our knowledge of human trafficking. If you do like a quick check in your head, probably some news, maybe some movies. Well, this is a very limited knowledge of human trafficking that we get. We probably just think about sex trafficking. We think about a female victim. However, there are many other forms of trafficking. The two major ones would be sex trafficking and labor trafficking. So people, including many men victims, who are actually being enslaved uh, because of uh, their labor. That's, uh, they're being used for uh, forced labor. This happens to children as well, adolescents at many parts of the world. We also have some other forms of slavery. For instance, people who are enslaved in domestic servitude, working at other people's houses. They have no documents. They receive hardly any money. Uh, it's not real work. It's a slave labor that they are actually performing. Another form of slavery, very common, sadly, in this area, Orange County, LA County, would be massage parlors and what takes place there. So even some establishments that may look legit to us at the first sight, they are not. And what's happening behind the closed doors is slavery. There are some specific forms of slavery that are just, uh, just concerned children because of the nature mm. of the activity. And sadly, children can be uh, and are being exploited mm. in all the other forms of slavery, such as labor uh, trafficking and sex trafficking. Mm. But also, two specific forms would be child soldiers, mm. so little boys and girls who are uh, being used used by the army. This especially happens in Africa, a little bit in Southeast Asia. And they are used by the soldiers to kill others, to become soldiers themselves. Girls are also being used and abused in these situations, forced to cook for the troops and forced to perform sex with soldiers. So it's a very, uh, very dark reality. The other side of the coin, only recently, mm. about two years ago, counted as modern slavery, is child marriage. So very young girls mm. who are maybe 10 or 12, who are being given in marriage to men who are at least 30 years older than them. That's what we need in order for it to be defined as uh, child slavery. And of course, there's a huge imbalance of power and money, and there are sadly all these different forms of slavery. One that gets mentioned very little, however, it is present in the UN uh, definition of trafficking, is organ trafficking. Mm. So also people who are being used, children as well, sold into slavery because of their organs. Wow. What's important to know is that it's not like they just 
fit, all fit into these neat compartments. Sometimes there's an overlap, so someone could be enslaved as in domestic servitude, but there's also sexual abuse, there's also sex trafficking taking place. So while we have all these typologies of slavery, there is a lot of overlap, sadly. Wow, wow that's really sad, especially the children part, yeah. you know? Um, so like, how do we um, contribute to slavery, even though we might not understand that we're contributing to it? I mean, I feel like society is so segmented, mm -hmm. it's like, I, I might be contributing to slavery without even knowing it. That's very true. Uh, sadly, especially if we think about labor trafficking, so, okay, where do our clothes and food come from? Oftentimes they do not come from the United States, they do not come from uh, very close to where we live. It comes all the way from the countries where labor is much cheaper. This labor oftentimes is uh, child labor and sla slavery, mm. the labor of slaves, so people who are maybe working on sewing our garments and uh, maybe also cocoa plants or some type of agriculture. These could be children or men and women who are living in slavery-like conditions. There are some ways of just educating yourself. For instance, if you just Google uh, your slavery footprint, it will take you to a website where just by stating what is your lifestyle, what are things that you're using, uh, it will tell you actually how many slaves work for you, how many people have been involved wow. and exploited in order for us to live our comfortable lives. So I know, again, it's very depressing, sad situation, but it's important to be aware of it. I think this is very biblical to realize what happens and how uh, we may be contributing, because all of us, including myself, we are, we are guilty of sin and we are guilty of, in some ways, just perpetuating this situation of slavery. That's right, that's right. It, co it contributes to our comfort, so it's like we want to perpetuate some of that, yeah. What are some, like, myths, you said, right, M or misconceptions of human trafficking? Yes, many people, when they think slavery, as I have already mentioned briefly, they would think a woman or a girl uh, innocent, naive, who was just uh, kidnapped or forced into slavery, where actually, even though this does happen, but a uh, common, much more common scenario would be that uh, these are people who are already in very, very vulnerable situation. So as my friend says, uh, oftentimes we don't connect the dots. It's not just about human trafficking, mm. it's about social justice, it's about people having access to education and resources, mm -hmm. because those who don't, they're just so much more vulnerable into trafficking. So there is this overlap. And uh, another issue would be, yes, let's be aware of labor trafficking. Let's be aware of exploitation of people in labor. For a long time, uh, in the very beginning, maybe about 10 years ago, people would not realize that slavery exists in the United States mm -hmm. and that United States nationals can be victims, can be enslaved. So it's been only fairly recently that we know that it's people from here. There's no country that's totally immune to human trafficking. Wherever there is people, there will be some forms of slavery. And even if you think back in history, uh, this is not something new. Even though it's only in the year 2000 when our government officially uh, defined human trafficking. Mm. However, uh, since a very long time, we can find in Genesis first accounts of slavery. I'm sure you remember the story of Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. This is another uh, myth in our society that it's only the bad guy, the trafficker, who kind of shows up out of nowhere and he is enslaving someone. Mm. No, sadly, oftentimes it is the families of people, just like what wow. happened to Joseph, that are s selling them into slavery and that are actually uh, perpetuating it. It happens within family, behind the closed doors. So it's not only uh, poor people, it's all kinds of backgrounds. It's uh, prostitution, even fathers or mothers exploiting their own children in order to make money. And finally, let's not forget that we do have victims who are boys, boys and men. Mm. It's so much harder to reach out to them. Our society is more used to seeing a female in a position of a victim, but we need to provide resources, counseling and help for boys who are being enslaved. We need to be able to face these topics. Oftentimes that intersects with other vulnerabilities, uh, issues like LGBTQ, that's all present there, it all overlaps. We do have also victims who are transgender, who are 
on the streets in prostitution as well. So these are not things that maybe come to mind right away, but really there's nobody immune to that problem. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think we'll unpack this a little bit more in the second part, but what is one way that if you could have all of us be involved in this, how can we be part of the change? Just one way. Well, I believe, first of all, by being here, you already are a part of the change, and it just warms my heart to know this, but I would strongly encourage you to talk to someone, at least one or two people, Preferably if it's someone in a position like you, Mike, who can actually organize an event, maybe invite a human trafficking victim to speak at your church within your community, get educated. And we do have resources, and I'm really glad to know that there's a lot going on here already. We have faculty members who are doing research in this area. We have a lot of students who are very sensitive to this topic. And before I came to Biola, I had already known that there is an anti-trafficking club on campus called Breaking Chains, and they are uh, coming up always with new initiatives. They need new members. They are on fire to do something specifically for this population. Great. Here's our first question, Laura. I've heard if you see something, say something. How would, you, how would we know what to look for and what it would look like to speak up if we do encounter a possible trafficking environment? That's a very good question. Actually, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for asking this. There are some uh, red flags, some things that we can pay special attention to when we just um, walk around this world and especially when we travel places like airports. If you see someone who seems like she does not exactly know where she is or he does not know exactly where they are, uh, there is someone else who seems to be making all the decisions for them. They do not feel free to talk to someone else if you casually try to strike a conversation and someone else presumably the trafficker, just kind of jumps into the situation, does not let you talk to them, does not let you ask questions. Or if, you, if they seem like they don't hold their own documents, that would be another red flag that we may see. However, I would say, do not say anything to the trafficker because this is potentially a very dangerous situation. What you should do, you should get in a safe uh, place, try to remember as many details as you can of the people that you're seeing, the place, etc., and call national uh, hotline for human trafficking, the Polaris number. This is really important that, uh, you know, we ourselves cannot actually jump into rescue. There's too much at stake. Mm. These situations are potentially very dangerous, so we need to, however, inform police inform uh, the task forces and take it from there. Of course, pray for the situation, uh, but do be alert to these, red, uh, to these uh, red flags and signs of slavery that you may see. Great, thank you. Here's another question. How often do human trafficking victims become survivors? What does this process look like? Sadly, it's not often enough. One of the problems we're dealing with to become a survivor uh, is a process. It takes time. It's a, such a traumatic experience. There's so much that they have been through for many, many years. While the physical wounds may be quicker to heal, but psychological wounds are just huge. So uh, this is a very difficult process. It's a spiritual healing as well. And of course, Satan is trying to attack them and lure them back into the world of slavery. They usually have a very low self-esteem. They have been told for years by the trafficker, you're good for nothing, there is nothing else you can do, mm. see your mind. There is mm. a Stockholm syndrome, so the type of a love relationship that they think it is love, of course it is not true love, that they uh, feel towards the trafficker who has been making all the decisions for them. So it is very difficult for them to stand on their own feet and not to be enslaved to the trafficker anymore. This is where spiritual component is very important. Mm. As we know, the book of Romans, all of us are slaves to something. It's either being slave to righteousness and God or being slave to sin. Mm. And we can identify with that. It is just so hard not to go back. Sadly, uh, victims and oftentimes even survivors of human trafficking, they go back. They're lured back into the world of trafficking. So it's a long process and it goes through multiple stages. Healing pretty much takes the whole life. Wow. Here's another question. 
You mentioned ways we can work against slavery with our purchase choices. Are there organizations we can support that are working on systemic issues, such as getting laws passed? Yes, uh, there are some organizations that are doing excellent job. I would say International Justice Mission is known to work more on the systemic level. Also, Samaritan's Purse that works closely with Biola. I love their approach to ending slavery. Uh, they're active in Cambodia and they do not only take the victims away or help the police to take the victims away from the streets. They are helping them to find jobs. They are also trying to create safer communities. Why do many people in the world end up in slavery-like conditions? Because they think that there's no alternative. Some organizations, like the Samaritan's Purse, they are providing jobs in agriculture so that people are not forced into selling their children into slavery. So these would be some that I can mention. Another one that operates nationally and internationally, does some great things, would be A21. They're often on campus here. And many more, like a smaller organization, maybe like a safe house, not too far. There is um, a special store in Fullerton that, for instance, sells goods that were made by women who are survivors of human trafficking. Mm. So you can make the choice of the next gift for your friend's birthday, instead of just buying something at the regular store, you can try to look for products, and of course online is a great, great resource, uh, products that were actually manufactured by survivors of human trafficking. Great, thank you. Here's another question. How is the church succeeding or failing in this sphere, and what should the church do more of to better represent Christ to the world when dealing with sex trafficking, slavery, etc.? The church is actually a really important player in anti-trafficking efforts. And it's so exciting to see when different organizations get together, there will always be some believers there as well. Because we have been sensitive to this issue long before it was actually even officially uh, defined. So on the one hand, church is doing a lot. There are many individuals, very active individuals in churches who are reaching out to the victims, who are involved firsthand. What's missing, in my opinion, it's something that all of us can do, and is to have the entire church involved as body of believers. Mm. People who leave slavery uh, do not necessarily uh, dress exactly the way we do. They do not necessarily use the same language we do. They may look a little differently, and while usually young people have no problems with that, it may be some other members of the congregation who just do not appear friendly enough. Uh, we are hoping for all the trafficking survivors to, to become a part of the body of Christ. So that it's not that they're just attending Bible studies for them in their world. No, we want them in our churches. We mm -hmm. want to be able to invite them to dinner. And as hard as it, as it may be to some people to invite someone who formerly was exploited in uh, sex trafficking into their table. They may have teenage sons and daughters, but it's important to talk about it. Mm. Uh, teenagers can and do understand these problems. And I think as church, we may do yet better in just opening up and full acceptance of uh, survivors of human trafficking. Yeah, great, thank you. Here's another question. Are there any key companies or organizations that utilize human trafficking that we should avoid supporting? Uh, that's a good question. I would say, uh, like a whole company, no, because thankfully we have laws in place that if it, if it is evident that this is what's happening, there are certain actions that are being taken by, thankfully, our government and governments of many countries. Uh, we should try to, I would say, on the other hand, we should try to support rather smaller businesses rather than huge companies. Usually if something is, just in general, very, very expensive, it does not mean that there is no slavery behind it. So mm. I would say uh, also on the other hand, if we, if we have very cheap goods, there is very likely something wrong with that. So it's worth it doing research on every single uh, type of products that we are using and going into details, especially things like maybe chocolate, look into that. Most companies, I would say on the positive side, will be saying we are not using slave labor at any part of our production chain. Uh, California actually has passed a law, uh, a law on production chain and how 
the, our government has to make sure that this is not happening. But sometimes I think just having less stuff, you know, in general, we don't need as many things as we think we do, as marketing and media make us think that we do. So saying no to uh, maybe just some desire that you have and deciding rather I would maybe pay a little more but get something that supports the victims or donate to an organization. This is something that I would encourage you to do. Yeah. Great. Here's another question. How do you stay hopeful and not let yourself to get discouraged while working in such a heavy topic? Another great question. Well, I hope that you're familiar with the idea of self-care. Whoever is in psychology, this is so important to us. Uh, there is a phenomenon call, called vicarious trauma. So mm. very common for people who are working with trafficking survivors it is so depressing, it is so hard that we become, we may become traumatized by just mm. hearing what uh, they have been through. So the way to stay hopeful for sure is prayer and staying in the word, uh, realizing that this is not all that there is. This is a problem as you get into it, it just, you see, it's huge. It's like a mm. tip of the iceberg. Just remember that it's so hard to get day down trafficking. We just, the more you study it, the more you research it, the more you realize that it's beyond our imagination how huge the problem is. So knowing that this is not all that there is in this world, there's a better world to come yet, and rejoicing in every little success story that we may have, uh, remembering these uh, things like positive devotional. There's um, a friend of mine, Sarah Malinowski, she put together a book that's a devotional written by, uh, with a little help, by uh, victims and survivors of human trafficking who share their journey. So there's this mm. period of darkness, but then there's hope at the end. Uh, this uh, really helps me. And sometimes it's just about, I hope for yourselves as well, uh, Sabbath, having periods of rest, uh, looking at the face of a beautiful baby boy or a beautiful baby girl and uh, taking time to do that. Um, little puppy, we all need that. We need ways of uh, just, taking care of ourselves and remembering that there's so much good in this world as well. Good, thank you so much for that. Here's another question. You talk about raising awareness or educating ourselves and others on the issue of sex trafficking. However, it seems like this issue is widely known about, yet people still don't act. What is an effective way to inspire college students to take tangible action against trafficking? I would say, I totally agree. I would say that uh, let's take it step by step. It's very hard. Most people would be like, oh, we want to help the victims. We want to go to a shelter and do something with them. Well, that's very delicate. They've been so traumatized. It's not so easy to come into contact with them, depending on what stage they're at when it comes to this healing process. So I would strongly encourage you to uh, start talking to people, organizing events, encouraging people to organize events at your churches. Uh, Educate yourselves in terms of let's not just base our knowledge on the stereotypes that are out there and sort of the typical stories, but let's try to find out what is going on in our area. Mm. What are some vulnerable populations? One of the things that uh, I'm actually doing with my graduate students, we are going out to a local high school and we're going to talk to the high schoolers about trafficking, about psychological implications of it. So. Uh, try to identify specific actions. Our Breaking Chains Club also has some really good ideas. Uh, last year they have raised some money, they have raised awareness. Connect with people and uh, just let the light of the Lord shine through you with every interaction remembering, uh, remembering the trafficking victims. Great, thank you. Another question, in what country do you see this slavery happening in the most? Another great question. So when we look at the world, the way actually our government does it, we have some countries that are primarily source countries, some countries that are uh, destination countries, and we also have transit countries, so where uh, victims are being, mostly they just transit through these countries. So depending on how you look at it, uh, the main source countries will be usually countries where there's a lot of poverty. Uh, I'm myself, I'm from Poland, so Eastern Europe, 
we were facing a lot of economic difficulties when we moved from communism to democracy. This was a time when slavery was just rampant. And until today, in Western European countries, you can see women from Eastern Europe, especially countries like Moldova or Romania. I could see a lot of women from these countries, for instance, in Italy. Uh, some African countries, uh, for instance, Nigeria, women who, who would be brought into slavery because of spiritual issues as well, darkness. So they would be told that there is uh, a possibility of a curse on their family if they don't do what, if they, if they don't, uh, if they don't act as sexual slaves elsewhere. Mm. So uh, also some Southeast Asian countries, when it comes to sex tourism, Cambodia is a huge, uh, it's a huge destination for uh, sex tourists from all over the world, and mm. actually we should say pedophiles. Uh, Thailand oh. as well. These would be countries where actually, sadly, in Thailand, it's a large part of the economy that's due to tourism, but what's behind it oftentimes is uh, sex tourism, and specifically people who go there, oftentimes they look for child victims. Wow. I mean, it, that's even on the internet, right? There's, yeah. there's like a, a, a child who's forced to do certain sex acts by the person through the internet too, right? That's right. We have uh, talked about the fact that today with the media, sadly, uh, there are no borders in a way. So sometimes the pedophile could be sitting somewhere in Denmark or in the United States or Australia, while the child who's being forced to perform sexual acts is maybe in the Philippines or somewhere in Southeast Asia. And the trafficker is right there and just following exactly what the pedophile is asking him to do. So. Not, not even the movement, physical movement of the person is necessary in this case. So heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, you know, the last question we ask is, what biblical principles have shaped your ideas for today? Well, I have been especially moved just by meditating upon Romans, the book of Romans, and uh, the idea of slavery that has been with humanity ever since uh, sin has entered the world. People have started to use and abuse one another. Uh, very sad what we know, the oldest profession in the world. There are women who have been exploited in prostitution called as the prostitute, both Old Testament and New Testament. Mm. And I have been greatly encouraged, especially when interacting with the survivors, for them to know that actually Rahab was in the lineage of Jesus. There is nothing that mm. the Lord cannot cleanse. There is nothing that, no sin that he cannot take away or forgive. And oftentimes, again, when interacting with survivors, they should remember that it is not their sin. One of them was saying, actually here at Biola, that what impacted her the most, it was other people's sin that was done to her. Mm. She was not an active part in it. She was a victim. And knowing how all that interplays, but there is this strong, uh, Theo a theological uh, metaphor of just all of us being slaves to sin. And that has been, I would say, the most important to me as I approach the topic. Great. Help me thank Dr. Laura Drianska for sharing your wisdom with us. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.